Trying to talk about Scrum and Agile in general without an even basic understanding of Lean is a bit like trying to figure out how to fly a plane without knowing anything about gravity. Yes, you could in principle fly a plane without knowing anything about gravity just by figuring out the mechanics of the controls. But you wouldn't be a good pilot that way and you wouldn't overcome problems. Likewise, you could do Scrum without having any idea about Lean, but you wouldn't do great Scrum. The gravity that is Lean was pioneered by Toyota after the Second World War and has since become the manufacturing standard of the world, but its influence has spread far beyond that. Every Lean principle and technique that I will discuss here applies fully to Scrum and Agile in general in one way or another, so at least the basic understanding of Lean is not a nice to have, but it is absolutely essential for anyone that wants to do Agile and Scrum well. We're going to understand Lean by looking at how a factory works, and I say factory because this example I'm going to show you is of a factory because it's just easier to show, but it would be exactly the same if this were software development or a bank or a design agency or whatever. The Lean principles are the same, it is just the specifics that sometimes differ. The point of this example is to show you the traditional way of reacting to business demands, but also to see how these kind of traditional improvements can become problems in themselves. We will then compare and contrast to the lean approach. The initial challenge is that, to the untrained eye, the traditional approach is more intuitive and the lean approach is not obvious at first. And that is why many managers to this day interpret and solve problems in a non-lean way. They get a local improvement which lulls them into thinking they've solved the issue, but that localized improvement causes bigger problems down the line or to the system as a whole. Lean teaches us how to see the system in its entirety and how to improve the overall performance and the performance that matters and not just optimize each piece individually. For what is a localized benefit could very well be an overall detriment. Once you start seeing things this way you will fall in love with it. But for now let's take a look at this factory and apply a traditional approach to improving its operations. This is a colored balls factory. Its input is three types of colored balls, red, blue and green, which it gets from its suppliers and its outputs are these balls put together in a certain way and packaged. The factory's business is acquiring these colored balls, turning them into the finished product and getting it to its clients. Lean is a way of organizing a business, building and delivering products or services. Lean is also a way of understanding who your client is and what they want, but in this chapter we'll focus on the doing part and we'll look into the client understanding part in the next one. Getting back to our model factory here, the production process is we need twice as many green balls as we need red or blue balls, as the finished product has two green balls and only one red and one blue. Additionally, green balls require a special cleaning step before assembly. Red and blue balls don't require this step. A traditional non-lean structure and process might look like this. Balls come in from the suppliers and they are unloaded into a storage location. From there they are taken to be cleaned if they are green or directly to assembly if they are red or blue. To do this we have four specialized and high performance assembly lines. One for green with green, one for blue with red, one for green green with blue red and the final one for the packaging with the final products being stored in another outgoing warehouse waiting for delivery to clients. So let's see what kind of problems we could have in this kind of business and how we would solve them in a non-lean way first, a traditional approach to scaling your business. First challenge we have as we get clients is the challenge of responsiveness. Clients order and they want their order delivered fast, but what if we don't have the balls ready? We have in turn to order from our suppliers, wait for that to come, then wait some more to process them into finished product and only then can we ship. A simple, apparently common sense solution would be to stockpile some balls or even better, some finished product. Just to have it ready and prepared, right? What's simpler than that? This is called inventory and inventory is the stuff that you already got and have but haven't sold yet. Inventory is about raw and processed materials but also about knowledge. If you develop a procedure for future use for example but you're not using it yet now, that's just another kind of inventory. Okay, so I've solved the problem of speed because if the clients order something we have it on stock. How much stock of what to have, we can figure that out as we go. We also want to be more efficient. 
We've invested in expensive equipment and we want to get the most out of it. We have four production lights plus one cleaning station for the green balls and we want each of them to be as fast as it can be and as utilized as it can be so they don't stay unused, turned off. We want them running and producing. Makes sense, right? This kind of efficiency mindset is a big deal in traditional business. Every component, every process, every team, every person, everything needs to be running at its maximum efficiency. One way to get efficiency is through specialization of the workforce. So we have people that are really good at assembling the green balls, for example, and using that equipment, but they wouldn't necessarily be very good at assembling red and blue balls, so they just stick to their area and so does everyone else. From a management structure perspective, we also want some clear responsibilities. So we might organize the company into three divisions. A head of supply, responsible for supplier management and for ordering raw materials and making sure we have enough of them. A head of production for the actual assembly and a head of sales for taking and shipping orders to clients. This kind of cascading of objectives and goals down the hierarchy each time breaking them down into smaller objectives is called management by objective or in short MBO. And you can do a little of it or a lot of it, cascading down many goals, many levels, breaking them down precisely and quantifiably at each step. The head of production could further cascade goals down to head for each assembly line who could be cascading down to each team and so on all the way down to each individual. Okay, so we now have an efficient factory with clear responsibilities, with modern equipment, with highly specialized and qualified workforce efficiently delivering. This inventory-based, specialized production efficiency mindset is a traditional way of doing business and it has worked well for a long time and it can still work well, especially in more static, less dynamic, less competitive markets. However, the more dynamic the market is, the more this model becomes a struggle and quickly becomes uncompetitive and here is where lean comes to the rescue. Fact is, in modern times, these quiet, settled markets are rarer and rarer and lean, rather than being a luxury, is more of a necessity these days. Our reliance on inventory stockpiling has solved our speed problem for a while, but it will create many other issues. First, inventory is an expense you haven't recouped yet, so that's a fundamental kind of problem, but let's say you can get around that to some degree through financial workarounds. So I'll just leave that aside for the moment and let's instead talk about a different kind of responsiveness. As long as your clients want pretty much the same thing, stockpiling can work, but what if their preferences and needs change? You've stockpiled the double green plus red and blue product, but what if they want the double yellow plus pink and black one? And the next day they want the six ball product, all magenta. Assuming you can even make these, your inventory soon becomes a headache instead of an advantage and inventory management starts to occupy more and more of your energy, clogging up your business flows if you're going to want to continue to solve your responsiveness problems through stockpiling. You can handle the increased complexity in inventory by increasing the complexity of your inventory management for a while by hiring more people, putting in place more systems, but that will only go so far and it doesn't make it less of a burden on your business. Inventory based businesses don't deal well with speedy dynamic markets. You quickly end up having too much of what's not selling and not enough of what is selling and the sheer complexity of managing it all gets exponentially more difficult as you stockpile more kinds of products. Your over-specialized equipment and workforce has also turned from a strength into a weakness as they are inflexible. Your clients want pink balls but your people cannot make them not without expensive adaptation and training. And once you do add a pink ball capability, is that one more specialized production line and one more specialized skill on top of the existing ones or are you going to take a different approach? Extreme specialization gets your localized efficiency. That is, each individual team or machine is most efficient in and by itself, but that can actually decrease the overall effectiveness of the system. You structured the company with clear accountabilities, but that may have, in time, led to a silo mentality. Which is what happens when managers care about their departments and turfs more than the overall company or the satisfaction of the client. Silo mentality is a culture problem, but the way the company is structured can encourage it or discourage it. Your supply manager feels like he did a good job if he has enough balls in the incoming warehouse, regardless if production can use them efficiently or not. Your production manager feels like she's doing a great job if she can keep the people busy and the machines running, regardless of who's buying what. And your sales manager is busy blaming everyone else for not supporting sales. The client is lost on everyone's mind. This kind of localized management mindset combined with a localized efficiency mindset can completely mess up your overall business flows and your culture. A good production manager will efficiently produce balls, but that is not an asset, but a problem if those balls cannot be sold in time. 
a great team on assembly line 3 will produce many of its products, but that is not a benefit but a problem if the assembly lines before it and after it cannot keep up. The speed of your system is the speed of its slowest link and having all the other already faster parts get even faster and more efficient is not going to help you one bit. Let's also talk about quality. A client calls you and tells you they received a defective product. The first of the two green balls cracks easily. You investigate and you find out that you have 15 finished products with the same defect waiting to be shipped to other clients, 20 more balls in various stages of production, 30 more in inventory and 50 more on the way from suppliers. All because of how large of an inventory you're working with. You can try to solve these problems with even more management sophistication. Let's get better at managing complex inventories. Let's buy better software solutions. Let's have better managers, more process, more rules. You can fight the problem this way and be successful for a while if you're smart and put in the work, but you're not solving the real issue. You're not eliminating the root cause. You're just managing a bad situation. You're putting out the fires, but you're not removing what causes them in the first place. This is where lean comes into the picture. We can start talking about lean by talking about feedback cycles, how you design them, how you put them in place, how you learn from them. If a client calls you about a defective product and you realize that that problem is because of a particular batch of some component you ordered a month ago, then your feedback cycle in this case is one month long. A month has passed from an action that you took, ordering those bowls, until you are faced with the consequences of that action, until you could learn from it. During that month you were blind, you kept working with that defective batch, maybe even order some more of the same. Feedback cycles apply to everything, not just factories. If you write code for six months before launching the product, you have a six month long feedback cycle. If you spend three weeks preparing that presentation for your boss, you have a feedback cycle of three weeks between your decision to invest in it and the feedback you get on it. You always want to shorten the feedback cycle in lean and agile. You want as little time as possible and as little risk as possible to accumulate between your actions and the feedback you get on those actions. But how do we do it? Some things just take time, don't they? Yes, some things do take time, but you'd be surprised how much of that time that things take is not a fundamental need driven by the nature of what those things are or how they are built, but it is instead a byproduct of how we organize our work and our company. And our reliance on inventory is one of the reasons why things take a lot of time. Going back to the quality question, you can reduce the quality feedback cycle, and it's always good to reduce the feedback cycle, any kind of feedback cycle, by adding checks and quality gates earlier in the process. And you should do that, but you also reduce the quality feedback cycle by reducing inventory. Reducing inventory is a fundamental change because it does not only remove stuff you don't need, but it also improves your business flows and your management mentality in all kinds of subtle but fundamental ways. Inventory is like sugar. You can make something tastier by throwing more sugar on top of it, but it's not a good long-term solution. Likewise, inventory can solve your flow and responsiveness just by having stuff lying around just in case, but it's not a good long-term solution either. Your health and the health of your business are going to suffer from too much sugar or too much inventory. Lean is, among other things, a way to reduce your dependency on inventory and to organize your business in a way in which it can react to demands quickly and, crucially, with shorter feedback cycles. With less inventory lying around, it's like the water retreats and things that were hidden become visible. Quality issues become much easier to spot and therefore to fix. Redundant steps and actions in your production process become obvious. The ever-evolving and changing needs of your clients are easier to see. Reduced inventory is a necessary reality check. The less stuff you have being processed but not quite yet ready or waiting to be processed or waiting to be shipped, the better your feedback cycles are going to be and the more agile and responsive of an organization you are going to build. Stop buying things in case you might need them, stop doing things just in case you might find a use for them and instead start applying the lean principles of just in time, just enough. 
Do something when you need to do it, not earlier, to the degree that you need to do it, not more. You have a customer order for three products, then quickly build three products, not more. You need 12 bowls for the three products, then quickly order 12 bowls, not more. In a perfectly lean world, there should not be a single bowl nor a single activity being performed in the whole factory that is not directly tied to a customer order. In practice, zero is at times a hard number to hit and diminishing return will kick in too, but you're always, always trying to minimize it. For example, if you go to Amazon now to order my book, Fun and Fearless Leadership, Amazon is more likely than not going to quickly print a copy just for you and ship it to you. This is a great demonstration of the just-in-time principle and Amazon can do it because they've set up their business that way. Imagine all the inventory headaches a business like Amazon would have to deal with and the kind of losses they would incur if they had to stockpile a certain quantity of each book they have on offer without the ability to quickly turn around and order or make a few more when they need it. The concept is that a push versus pull and I'm going to tell you or Taichi Ono from Toyota learned it from back in the 40s and it was in the American supermarkets where he first saw it. The basic idea is simple. You sell a multitude of products, new products come in all the time, old products are discontinued, seasons and trends change, so much of what you're selling has to change as well. Some things change more than others, but change is pervasive. The inventory way of managing this change is to stockpile different but large quantities of each product every week or every month, let's say. This is called push because you're effectively pushing what you already have onto your customers. They're not buying what they want, they're buying what you thought they would want at this point in time. Or they're not buying at all and they're going to the competition. The alternative is pull. You get a small quantity of each product and you see what sells. If you have five bottles of a particular kind of wine, for example, and that's all you have on stock, you let your customers, in this case, literally pull it from the shelves and you set up a trigger, for example, two. And when you get to have only two bottles of that wine, you order five more, but not more than five. You make these kinds of decisions daily or more frequently for each product, as opposed to making a big order ahead of time once in a while and ordering a lot of everything based on a forecast. The profound advantage of pull is not only that you get to have less inventory, less expense, less headache, more quality, but it also connects you straight to the demand. You get access to the invaluable, unfiltered decision-making of your clients. They're literally telling you what they want by pulling it from the shelves and you can react to it because you're lean, you're not stockpile based. Likewise, in a car factory, for example, you're not pushing cars onto customers. Instead, you're letting them pull. You see what models and variants sell better and make more of that. Just in time, just enough. You then turn to your suppliers and you order the raw materials and components you need from them again just in time just enough you let the customer tell you what they want and you build your business as a great reaction machine to it push versus pull and just in time are universal concepts in a software business for example if you have your business analyst write a whole bunch of requirement documents and then give them all at once in a batch to your developers so they have enough work for a few months you've stockpiled the requirements and you built an inventory of them and now you're pushing them on to your developer instead do one small requirement document at a time give it to the developer and let them pull, that is, ask for more when they need it. In this way, you're reducing inventory, you're reducing upfront work, but you're also getting faster feedback cycles and better quality. If there's something wrong with how the requirements are written or if the developers have a suggestion, you get to find that out quickly and before you make the same mistake in 20 other documents. Everywhere you're looking can find a place to apply just in time and move away from push towards pull. These are some of the most universally applicable principles in business. Working like this requires a fast, dynamic, responsive organization that is not easy to build because it has different ways of organizing itself, different processes, different supply chains, and a different mentality. But this is the lean agile organization that you do need to build in order to be competitive in dynamic markets. The full transition from inventory-based business to lean can take years in case of entrenched corporations and it requires profound changes, including in the culture and collective mindset of the company, but it's a real change. It's not a fad, it's not a PowerPoint revolution, it's a transformative process that will set the foundations for a new, better, more competitive and more sustainable way of doing business. Of course, there's no shortage of shallow, lean or agile transformations where companies adopt the lingo and some of the formalities, but not the substance. But that's a conversation for another time. The good news is that if you're a startup or a smaller company and you have the will to do it, you can do it much faster. We have to talk about waste as well. Lean is nothing if not an attempt to reduce waste and the concept of muda, waste in Japanese, and its reduction is absolutely central to lean. 
Lean has a list of what it calls the seven fundamental wastes and the fundamental cause of all waste is overproduction, doing more than you need to, before you need to do it, or doing the wrong thing. You fall victim to the overproduction waste by stockpiling, by pushing instead of pulling, by focusing on efficiency to the detriment of value, and by not being connected to your customers. You avoid it by being lean, by organizing your business in a just-in-time manner, and by favoring pull as opposed to push. Waste is not just the stuff that we throw away. Waste is every inventory, every action, every decision, everything that you do that is not directly connected to value. Value being defined as something that is necessary for the successful delivery of our product or service to clients. With Lean, you're always looking to simplify, to reduce, to optimize, to deliver more with less. All right, so we're getting to the end of our Lean intro. Putting it all together, how could our colored bolt factory look like in a Lean world? Here's one likely shape it could take. First, and obviously you don't stockpile anymore, but that's a given by now. Also, your relationship with your customers would change. Your storefront, your delivery mechanism would have to change in order to give them the flexibility to order and get what they want when they want it. Your relationship with your suppliers would have to change as well. You'd have to integrate better, work closer with them. In effect, you'd need to have Lean suppliers because they'd have to react to your orders with the same flexibility with which you would react to your client. You might need to change suppliers. Internally, in your management structure approach, you'd probably take a more horizontal view as opposed to a vertical one. Rather than splitting your company up based on the stages of your production process, you might split it based on value streams. What is a value stream? A product, a suite of products, or a service you're providing to your clients and everything this entails, including production and supplier management. So you might have a head of the double green plus blue and red product and should be accountable for everything related to that product end to end, including sales, taking orders, client management, but also production and supplier management. Similarly, you might have a head of the four ball all magenta product. Does this mean that all these heads of products have their own production capabilities separate from each other and their own different suppliers? Not necessarily. There could still be a head of production, but this function is now more about offering a flexible production capability that can serve the diverse and ever-changing needs of the heads of products rather than being an internally focused, efficiency-only driven job. You do this by maybe replacing the four different assembly lights with the more configurable equipment, they can do all kinds of balls. But more importantly than the technology, you do it with a new mindset, a new understanding and a new culture, a value-driven culture. Silo mentality is much less likely to appear when you structure a company like this because accountability is now horizontal, following the value stream, facing the clients and not based on internal logic. You are much more likely to be driven by the market rather than your own internal drivers. Short feedback cycles are everywhere, things are done and tested in a just-in-time fashion, demand is pulled, not pushed and waste is reduced. Efficiency still matters, but value is more important. The company is now not only better today, but also better at learning and adapting. It's better at getting better. This is the power of Lean. So Lean is all about quick feedback cycles, responsiveness, reduced inventory, reduced waste, and a whole bunch of other techniques and principles I've barely scratched the surface of. Lean is in and by itself probably vaster and larger than everything we call Agile, so obviously I cannot give you a comprehensive overview of Lean as an intro to a Scrum course, but I do hope I've given you enough of a feeling about this force of gravity that is Lean and that underlies everything we call Agile, be it Scrum or anything else, and that is going to help us be better at what we want to do. Everything I've mentioned about Lean here applies fully to Scrum, sometimes as a general principle, sometimes in a specific way, and we'll discuss about that in the following chapters. Let's get to work.